All right, scholars, thanks for tuning in. Let's take a look at population ecology. This presentation will help you understand population characteristics and population growth dynamics. Population, remember, means a group of individuals of a species that live in a particular area. Several attributes help predict population dynamics or changes in population. Population size, population density, population distribution, sex ratio, male to female, age structure, and birth and death rates. We're going to take a look at each of these. Population size is the number of individuals present at a given time. Here we see the passenger pigeon, which, which was once North America's most numerous bird, but is now extinct. 240 mile long flocks have been observed. Check out this picture. You can see this incredibly long flock, 240 miles. Very, very high population density, which means number of individuals per unit area. And um, here you see shooting wild pigeons in Iowa. Well, little did they know they would become extinct. This is a picture from the 1800s. There can be different ways of populations becoming distributed spatially. So here we have a random distribution. Here we have a clumped distribution, which might have it, which might have happened because they need a particular kind of habitat. They offer protection to each other, or maybe for mating purposes. Here's a uniform distribution, which might be a territorial issue, or it could be that there are certain nutrient requirements that require them to have space um, between each other. Age structure is also called age distribution, and it means the relative numbers of individuals of each age or age class in a population. So this diagram we call an age structure diagram, and it shows this information. It takes different ages and breaks it into um, years. So this is like a snapshot. If you were to go and look at a population, you would add up how many individuals are between zero and five years old, how many are between five and 10, between 10 and 15, 15 and 20, etc. And on the left side, how far away you get from the central axis would mean how many there are. So we can see that as, um, as you look at a population, you have fewer people in the older ages, which is not, uh, not unexpected as people die. It is also broken down into the pre-reproduction age, the reproduction age, or I should say pre-reproductive age, reproductive age, and then post-reproductive age. And you can see here, for humans, that's in the mid-40s. That's where menopause typically kicks in. So this can tell us a lot of information because depending on the shape of it, we can make some, um, some predictions. If we have a shape like this, we can say that it is a population that is probably increasing rapidly because there are so many young present in the, in the population. And all these here, in about 15 years, are going to become reproductive members of their population. Whereas here, we still see a pyramid effect where it's still bottom heavy. So we would still say that it's increasing, but more slowly. Here's a population that's more stable. You have roughly equal number of individuals uh, in each age bracket. And here's actually a decreasing population because you can see that there are fewer young than there are old. So what are the key things to remember here? More young, represented by wider base, means population growing. More old, represented by top heavy, means population declining. We're going to take a look at this in more detail in our next unit on population, specifically human population. Sex ratio means the ratio of males to females in a population. And even ratios near 50-50 are most common, although fewer females, um, let's step back for a minute, they're most common, but you'll notice in the older ages, just a FYI, we typically see females outliving males, as you can see here. These are all wider than these for the males. And it is important to note that if you were doing a age structure diagram on a population and you see that there are fewer females, you know that's going to cause slower population growth. We're looking at this mostly in the context of humans because, well, um, the examples I was giving, but you could take a look at it for any kind of population, like a fish population. For example, if you saw that in that fish population that mostly you were seeing a shift toward younger, uh, younger fish, then you might make the conclusion that the older fish are being over-harvested that the younger fish are not being given a chance to grow into adulthood, where they're more likely to produce um, uh, the next generation. So 
indicate you need to slow down your fishing. Now let's take a look at something called exponential growth. Here we see a Scottish pine tree and we can see some data here years after initial colonization. So this is um, this was happening in Europe where a glacier retreated and so you had an area with no trees and over a course of several hundred years they monitored the tree population of the Scottish pine and they found that it was growing at an actual exponential rate. Now typically um, well, what does that mean? It means when a population increases by the same percentage each year, then it is experiencing exponential growth. So just looking at this, um, the rate of exponential growth is probably increasing by about maybe, um, well, a few percent each year. So if one year it had 100, the next year it would have 103. The next year it would have whatever um, 103 plus 3 percent is. This is um, something that we also talk about with money. Unregulated populations increase by exponential growth, similar to money growing in a savings account. If you put in a thousand dollars into a bank account at birth, if it was earning five percent annual compound interest, then you can see how much that money would become. And by the time you're 80, it would be worth 49,000, roughly 50 times more than you first put in. So we call these a J curve sometimes because they, they swoop up like a J and um, they can cause extremely rapid growth. Here's an interesting fact for you. A single bacteria cell, given all the food it needs, could divide into a ball of cells the size of the earth in 24 hours. And in this case, a bacterium dividing represents a growth rate of 100%. You're getting a whole new cell in addition to the original because it's splitting into two. Most, most of the time when we talk about exponential growth, we're talking about increases of like 5 or 10% or, or even less. But this is a unique characteristic of bacteria because they split. So this is more, this is more typical. You know, that last example was given all the food the bacteria needs. But that's not a realistic situation. There are limiting factors such as the availability of water, space, food, the presence of predators, as the number of um, individuals in the population increase, there's going to be um, there's going to be um, there's going to be more predation on them, and also there's going to be greater disease because usually there's also going to these organisms will not be closer together, better able to communicate diseases to each other. So you can see here that it starts off with time on the horizontal. We're getting that J curve, but then the J curve begins to flip. We have what we call an inflection point. There it begins to stabilize and plateau. Where it plateaus is has a special name, the carrying capacity. The carrying capacity is the theoretical maximum population size that that habitat can support. Here we see some data of yeast growing in a in a test tube, and so we can see that they can they can't multiply um, or they can't their population cannot grow exponentially. At some point, they reach a limit, they um, begin to um, use up their energy supply, things like that. So this is only one model for logistic growth. Other ones can be like with these mites, where it fluctuates. And it always fluctuates sort of around a carrying capacity that you might say is around 4,000. Here's another one that you might see dampening oscillations like you would see with this beetle where they're increasing but then for whatever reason maybe their food source runs out then their food source grows back and then um, their food source runs out again grows back and they might reach a steady state eventually um, arriving at more of a more of a even carrying capacity or more of an even um, population near its carrying capacity we also see this happening sometimes. This happened on St. Paul Island with reindeer that were introduced in the early 1900s. Their population was basically increasing exponentially. You can see here it takes off the J-curve, but then boom, crashed as they depleted their resources, probably the vegetation they were eating. Here's another interesting model we'll take a look at. Here we have a lynx and a hare. And um, there's data been collected since the mid 1800s going to the early 1900s where you see the uh, 
the hair in blue, the links in red, and if you look here, first the hair population declines, then the hair, then the links over here too. First hair population declines, and then the links that depend on them. Even here, there's a time time lag, or we might say a phase shift, and uh, you see it happening here too. So this is a um, this is a commonly discussed model where changes in prey population are followed by changes in predator population. And of course, um, as you have the number of predators decreasing, now you have a chance for those prey to grow back. And then as they grow back, the predators can grow back as well, their population size. All right, let's take a look at factors that are related to the density of the population. Often survival or reproduction lessens as populations become more dense, and this can be another explanation for that logistic growth curve, the fact that it begins to stabilize. So this explains the logistic growth curve. Too many individuals too close together, and what happens? Resources run out faster, disease increases, and you get more predation. And so it can explain that shape. There can also be density independent factors, which can occur regardless of density. So, example, catastrophic weather events, hurricanes, um, major droughts, things like that. You can also have volcanic eruptions. Here you see some animals um, in front of Paranacota volcano in Chile. And so if this volcano blew, it could affect this population, which has nothing to do with their density. Here's another concept for this um, topic of population ecology, biotic potential, the ability to produce offspring. This is high for species producing lots of young. And here we see striped blenny fish eggs. R and K selected species um, are two ways of categorizing biotic potential. R selected species have very high biotic potential. They have many offspring, they're fast growing, they offer no parental care, and examples are fish, frogs, and insects. Whereas K-selected species have few offspring, they're slow growing, they have parental care, such as mammals, birds, and humans. Where do these terms come from? R means intrinsic rate of population increase, meaning populations can potentially grow fast, have, having high R. K is a symbol for carrying capacity. Populations tend to stabilize near their, near their carrying capacity. You don't have to know why, this is just kind of in case you're interested. But what's important here is that our selected species are better able to rebound after a disturbance because they do reproduce quickly. And uh, we're going to end with this last part here, survivorship curves. What we have here on the horizontal axis is age, going from young to old. And on the vertical axis, number of survivors, going from one up to a thousand. So if you had a thousand um, frog eggs that you were starting with, within the first few years, most of those die off. Um, and if you made it to that point, you're probably going to make it pretty well um, to old age. Case strategists have a different, um, a different curve, like humans. Most human babies survive, um, they're cared for, and then as they get older, that's when death begins to happen more. So for case strategists, it's likely death when old. For our strategists, it's likely death when young. We call this type 1 and type 2, sorry, type 1 and type 3. Type 2 is in the middle. It just means that at every particular age of, um, of the life of an organism, there's a equal probability of dying. Whereas here, there's a greater probability of dying when you're younger. Here, there's a greater probability of dying when you're older. So just one other thing as we talk about population ecology. Okay, what I'd like you to do is at the end of your notes, please write a reflection summary of the main ideas presented here. And this should be about four to five sentences. See you tomorrow in class.